and uh, and both uh, Alexandre and uh, Greg uh, hopefully will uh, will join us. Okay, so let let's start now since we have the two uh, first. Uh, panelists uh, with us. My name is uh, Arnaud Goulombel. I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the University of Chicago Center in Paris. It's my great pleasure to welcome the, the participants and, and panelists for this webinar on William Seitz's book, Sunrise uh, Chicago, Afrofuturism and the City. This uh, event is organized by the University of Chicago Center in Paris in partnership with the University of Chicago Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy and, and Practice, the University of Chicago Press, and the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture at the University of Chicago. I would like to thank, to thank uh, Bill Seitz uh, and the five uh, panelists for accepting to be part of this uh, event. And I would like to give a special thank to Alexandre Pierpont, who helped me with the, the conception and the uh, organization of this webinar. I also would like to thank uh, Frédéric Trottier uh, for accepting to be both a panelist and uh, the moderator of this, uh, of this webinar. Um, I'm going to uh, present very briefly uh, what we what what the University of Chicago Center in Paris is, um, and then I will turn it over to uh, Frédéric Trottier, who will uh, moderate uh, the discussion. So here at the Center in Paris, we are uh, essentially one of the satellites of the University of Chicago in, in Europe, uh, and we are focusing on uh, our activities on three sets of things. Uh, one of which is pedagogical, which is providing undergraduate University of Chicago students with uh, opportunities to take classes at our center. The other axis of our activities is uh, research oriented, and we help University of Chicago researchers to conduct uh, their activities and investigations while they are in Paris. And the final one is to establish partnerships and collaborations between University of Chicago scholars and uh, scholars from Europe, Africa, and uh, the Middle East. Uh, let me now introduce uh, Frédéric, Frédéric Trottier, who is going to, to moderate uh, the, um, the discussion. So Frédéric Trottier is an anthropologist of electronic music. His dissertation entitled uh, Techno Worlds in Detroit is uh, mainly based on participating observation of four young uh, DJs' life and festival ethnographies. Frédéric taught urban anthropology at the University of France. He is an associate member of the center uh, Georg Simmel and also a consultant at the Philharmonie de Paris, uh, Cité de la Musique. So, Frédéric, I turn it over to you, and I will be back at the end of the panel discussion for the Q&A with the audience. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Arnaud. Um, tell everyone, uh, hello, Alexandre, too. Um, so, uh, we basically, so William, I, I will start to, to introduce you, then make a, a really short uh, summary about your book, then present all the panelists. All right. Uh, so William Seitz is a, an associate professor in the Crown uh, Family School uh, of Social Work, uh, Policy and Practice at the University of Chicago. His fields of interest include urban and community studies, political economy, race, music and culture, uh, social theory, and historical methods. Uh, his first book, Remaking New York, uh, Primitive uh, Globalization and the Polit Politics of Urban, Urban Community, explores the transformation of New York City during the final quarter of uh, the 20th century. His recent publication on SONRA includes articles uh, in the Journal of Urban History, uh, Urban Ge Geography, but also uh, uh, American States. So many works, basically many works, and he says uh, have been written about uh, Sunrise Live, so from, from 1914 uh, to 1993. Uh, but William Sad's book, uh, we are introducing and debating here. So just quick. 
presentation of the book. Uh, Sunrise uh, Chicago, uh, Afrofuturism in the City, the University of Chicago at Southern, argues about Sunrise life from a urban perspective, but not only. William Sites untangled a Sunrise path from when he was a man blount uh, in Birmingham uh, to developments of Chicago's South Side, uh, Sonny Blount, by locating him uh, in his environment and depicted, depicting him, uh, depicting the, this environment, sorry. So through uh, eight chronological chapters, Chicago places and music venues makes us uh, dive in many aspects of Sunrise's life from more than being a black man coming from Saturn, a musician, a spiritual guide, and an icon of Afrofuturism. So let me now talk much more about the for uh, other panelists and the ways that we are going to handle the, the subject. Um, so first panelist will be John, John, John Swede, uh, who is a, an adjunct senior research scholar at Columbia University, where he was a professor of music and jazz studies, editor in chief of the web magazine jazzstudiesonline.org and their director of the Center for Jazz Studies from 2008 to 2014. He's the author of many books on jazz and American music, including studies on Sunra. So, so space is the place of lives and times uh, of Sunra at uh, Pantheon Books 2000, but also studies about uh, Miles Davis, uh, Jelly Roll Morton, uh, Alan Lomax, and Billy Holiday. Uh, so today our second panelist will be uh, Nicole Mitchell. So Nicole, uh, you are an award-winning creative flutist, composer, conceptualist, band leader, and educator. So you are also the director of jazz studies in the University of Pittsburgh Dietrich School, and your research centers on the powerful legacy of contemporary African music and um, African American culture, sorry, and Black experimental art. Then we will have the, uh, Alexandre, Alexandre Pierre Pont, uh, who is an anthropologist whose work focuses on African American music as an alternative social institution. Uh, so since 2012, Alexandre is the artistic director of the French American exchange program, The Bridge, called The Bridge, a transatlantic network for jazz and creative music. So he's the author of La Nuit, uh, Association for the Advancement of Creative Studies, Un Jeu de Société Musicale, so at uh, the French uh, editor, Edition Parenthèse, 2015, but as well as uh, Chaos, Chaos, Cosmos, and Music, or maybe in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a translated version, but Chaos, Cosmos, Music, at the uh, Musica Falsa Edition in 2021. And last but not the least, Greg, uh, Greg Tate, uh, is uh, a music and popular culture critic, a journalist whose work has been appeared in uh, many publications, including The Village Voice, uh, Vibe, Spin, The Wire, and Downbeat. And he's the author of Flyboy in the Buttermilk, essays on contemporary America. But he also wrote Midnight Lightning, Jimi Hendrix, and The Black Experience. Uh, so great uh, via guitar and baton. Uh, also leads the conducted improvisation ensemble uh, called Burnt Sugar, the Orchestra Chamber, who toured internationally. So thank you, everyone. And uh, just to, to quick remi reminder, so everyone is going to, each, each of you is going to, to, to exchange and debate and have a, a conversation with William during uh, 15 minutes, if we all agree about that. Uh, and then uh, the uh, larger discuss discussion uh, will be engaged with uh, the public. So I, I just let John, if you if you want to to start to to and to engage the, the discussion with William. Thank you. I thought I could start with saying a few words about um, what writing about anybody's life entails. The assumption that uh, Sun Ra was a particular a particular study in biographical resistance. It's not the only one, but uh, in fact, there's several books published about how they couldn't write the book. Most famous being The Search for Corvo, um, which the author never found. There's another one at the H. Lawrence. So you can, you can write biographies about failed biographies. Anyway, my notion was that um, this might 
Maybe the you, you, you have to talk to me. Bill, is it? Bill, okay. Either William or Bill. Uh, yeah. Um, I need you to talk about your own experience. Uh, reading your book uh, sent me to thinking just how many ways a person's life could be rendered in print. I'm long past the point, long past the point of believing or ever believe that there could be a single definitive life history. Because for no other reason that um, no one's life has ever been lived the way a biographer writes it. Point of how the writing was done and how it's rendered. Say nothing of the fact that uh, people change through life and, and biographies tend to freeze them in one place. So what they said at one place is not what they thought later. This is obvious, but not, not obvious always to biographers, I guess. One question I think is worth uh, still thinking about is who gets a biography written about? So, uh, that set me to thinking a long time. I don't know much about it, but I do know that Thomas Carlyle once wrote a biography of a person he thought was totally worthless. He said he was of no significance at all, except that he thought he was typical of the times he was writing. <laughs> um, I tried to figure some wrong that it doesn't work. Um, Samuel Johnson, time biographies first began, said everyone should have a little biography. <laughs> Look for a writer for that, <laughs> um, maybe. But some people's lives seem to generate endless readings. Lord, one of the sunrise people said to me, you know, he's a mirror. We all got a different reading of him. How do I do this? Um, incidentally, uh, Bill, your, your footnotes could generate another. <laughs> 50 books of their own, I think. Amazing. My book on Sun Around the Arcs is written after I'd spent a year with, with him being there with him at least once a week and, and traveling with him and actually producing a couple of things at Columbia on Halloween. Mm -hmm. um, and I also smoked and drank a lot with him, which may or may not have bearing on what I'm going to say. But whatever. At any rate, the longer I spent with him, Difficult the task came, I thought, and I, I, I just couldn't get started. And what got me out of that was discovering a novel by John Crowley from uh, 1987 called Egypt, spelled A E G Y P T. It's since changed the title to the Solitudes, mm. one of a series of books. But what I found in there, it's about a, it's about a failed academic who's trying to write about Elizabethan magic, and um, Tales again, but um, what I encountered was many quotes and discussions of the very books that I was finding in Sunrise Library. So I got this idea that I could I could read all of Sunrise books. Looking at this author turning um same books into a novel, I could look, read these books and I'd be looking over his shoulder. So this maybe he gets some sense of his own personal cosmology. It's a foolish idea, it turns out, because um, although I did learn a lot as a student in his extension course, I suppose, but I don't, the thing is, when I look back, oh, look, I, don't, I don't remember writing a lot of this. I want to say, I don't want to say I wrote it under a trance, well, that would be nice, um, or that it was automatic writing, but it was a strange experience, and I don't think I could do it now. Although I'm doing a book which is equally problematic, you know, Harry Smith biography, mm. even more obscure than Sun Ra's life. Anyway, at the time I thought there was nothing left to write. And I just had to quit at some point. However, um, now I look back and say um, some simple things. Did Ra really say he came from Saturn? I mean, I know he said he visited there. And yes, his passport did say Saturn. Did he actually say that? Salvin Singh was touring with him once and he said, I got to look at his passport and there was some other shit in there, you know? Um, There's a story about how that came to be. Was Ra's abduction in Chicago or was it in Alabama? In Birmingham, as he told the story. Yeah, it's, um, it's never clear now. I thought at the time it was music. Or Huntsville, I guess, yeah. How could he maintain that he was not human and continually drop hints about his human existence, still maintain these 
It's just nice. Mm -hmm. Some now write about the Sun Ra as gay or queer, but no one I met knew him well ever confirmed anything about his sexuality. By the way, that's also true of Miles Davis. One thing I've learned about writing biographies is everyone wants to know about their sexual practices. And they've already decided. <laughs> so you, you walk into a trap one way or the other. Is this a question of definition? I mean, people have definitions, maybe. Um, but it's something that just wouldn't come up in the discussion. You know, when I raise it, I worried that I, I might have overstated uh, Sun Ra's concerns without his space at the cost of his Afro Baptist um, background, because at his funeral, which I thought would have been a nightmare for him, alive, there seemed to be no inconsistency, no contradiction between Baptist, Southern Baptist thinking and some of the actually ministers quoted things from the Old Testament that sounded <laughs> remarkably like Sun Ra. I used to talk about it, talk of this, um, about this with Mary Baraka, and he thought, um, I won't go into that, but he did say, if we ever opened up Southern Baptist religions of the world, we'd find out that in some church or other, everything was possible. Another one thing that bothers me, what does it mean to say that he's a godfather of Afrofuturism? How do we fit that with, say, Kudu Oishun's comment that he was a despotic monarch and a queen? Or those who say, well, he was an old guy or a gentleman that wouldn't expect. Or, or Martin Sim's mundane Afrofuturist manifesto. You all know that one? Or Eddie? Mm. Afrofuturism? Did I quote a couple of things? Let's see. So specifically, it's aiming at, um, well, here's just a line. Jive talking aliens, jive talking mutants, magical Negroes, references to Sun Ra. She bases this on, on, on the sci-fi writer's um, manifesto against uh, the way science fiction went. And she follows the, um, I was the question all the way through. And, you know, every now and then saying, we're not going to settle. Come on, get over that. Aliens are not going to save us. I have the feeling that she's having fun. But, um, uh -huh. John, could, John, could I jump in and say something about biography? Because I think that it's you. That's that's I think, you know. I mean, one of the things I wanted to sort of say is that um, I one of the things I was trying to do with this book was to not write a biography, in part because you had already written such an extraordinary biography. Um, and so. Destruction. And, and so one of the things that I struggled with was um, the feeling on the one hand that there's more to say about Sun Ra, but on the other hand, how rich um, your own treatment was. And, and I think for, you know, it was always a question for me, what could I bring to this project as well? And, and I think I'm an urbanist. And, and what really struck me that, that still needed to be explored was Sun Ra's relationship to his cities. And so part of what I, set out to do was not, you know, even though all of the books about Sun Ra, I want it to be not really a book about Sun Ra in some ways as much about Chicago. That I think the conventional images that many of us bring to the city, if we're not from the city, um, have sort of missed um, some key elements of, uh, of African American culture in particular, and in particular during the 1940s and 50s when Sun Ra was here. And, and my, you know, my, my sort of launching point for the book was very much what would Southside culture look like and what would the city of Chicago look like if we positioned Sun Ra at the center of it? And in the process, by doing that, um, we might also learn some interesting more things about Sun Ra, or we might also begin to see some, some relationships that Sun Ra or Sonny Blunt had to the South Side, to the community, to other musicians in ways that I think um, aren't always fully appreciated. You know, that for, for me, the, the, the key that if I suppose in some ways it's a biographical key to understanding Sun Ra in Chicago was the, the religious broadsheets that I don't think were as available uh, when you were doing your biography and which I felt in many ways revealed so much about um, 
Sun Ra, Alton Abraham, uh, their, their colleagues, in terms of the kind of thinking and the ways in which they thought about cultural creation, the way they thought about community, the way they thought about history. And so drawing on and reading, I'm doing in, in some ways what you described earlier, which is kind of reading, reading those broadsheets over the shoulder of those who, uh, who had written them um, to sort of begin to understand Ra's reading of the Bible as, and rereading of the Bible uh, as key to understanding his understanding of African-American history, of, Afri of the roots of African-American uh, and of African civilization, and the ways in which um, what we now call Afrofuturism is deeply grounded in certain kinds of intellectual traditions that are theological, uh, that are uh, biblical, that draw on a range of different religious sources. And much of what Ra and Abraham were attempting to do over the course of the 1950s was to kind of take these, these ideas, these notions that, um, that black people were present and were creators of the most ancient civilizations, that um, the links between uh, African-Americans and, and, and other Afro-diasporic peoples have been submerged but need to be revealed in order to understand what a, a genuine and free post-war African-American identity might look like in this strange place in America, in North America. That, that, that sort of intellectual journey was absolutely key to what Sun Ra and Alton Abraham were trying to do when they took those ideas out onto the bandstand, when they took them into the commercial music world of the South Side, when Ra um, was writing compositions like India or uh, things like um, you know, ancient Ethiopia. Uh, that I think that there's really um, a lot to be learned by looking at those broadsheets. And what I tried to do was to kind of unpeel them backwards and see the intellectual lineages and then think about how Sun Ra and Alton uh, carried them forward over the course of the 1950s when they created the orchestra, when they created El Saturn, and when by the end of the 1950s we begin to see um, the orchestra looking like and Sun Ra looking like uh, and playing music that gestures forward toward the kind of Sun Ra that we, that we know subsequently from the 60s and beyond. Yes, and needless to say, Chicago was the weakest part of my book. I was worn out by the other two <laughs> cities, and um, I was quite pleased that I. I part, the part, of, part, of, part of what I tried to do, part of, part of what I tried to do as well, was to kind of build on your work on Birmingham as well, which I thought was a really remarkable part of your book, um, and. Um, I think that you know that this was also very consistent with what I was trying to do, which is um, once, as I said earlier, I wanted to sort of sort of situate Sunrod at the center of South Side Chicago culture of the 1940s and 50s. In order to do that, I had to know a lot more about Birmingham, um, and I th had to really understand what it was that Sunra um, developed over what was already a major career. I mean, he came, he came to Chicago when he was 33 years old, and he had already had an extraordinary childhood growing up downtown in Birmingham. He'd had an extraordinary musical experience being trained by Fess Watley at the Industrial High School. He'd been a leader of a territory band, and he'd also created, um, as I think you quite um, eloquently described uh, in, in Space as the Place, uh, within his grandmother's house in downtown Birmingham. He created a kind of musical and philosophical salon that really in many ways foreshadows much of his sort of intellectual project, his musical project, and what I think of as his community building project. And that was one of the things that I really wanted to emphasize about Sun Ra is, you know, my own background as a community organizer and as someone who writes about community organizing and uh, in many ways, it's useful to think about Sun Ra as a very unorthodox community organizer, someone who actually made community connection with, with local residents, who brought them into networks, who encouraged them to think about the world anew and to challenge the material realities in front of them, the notion that the world could be different, 
and to provide a set of tools, in this case, music and musical resources and ways of thinking about music um, that might provide a vehicle to, uh, to traveling to that world that we want to be rather than the world that we're in. And so, you know, I think that locating Birmingham as a starting point for much of this is a really, is, is a useful and, and even necessary thing with Sun Ra. I think um, a lot of, uh, a lot of what I found was either a bad luck or good luck. Alton Abrams was not interested in talking to me. Well, he was interested in talking to me about Sun Ra, let's put it that way. He had there was friction and so forth. And, Made that clear, but he wanted to talk about the Philippines, and I think it's worth noting, if I'm not if I'm not wrong about this, that the first Saturn record is Filipinos singing religious, not religious, but uh, medical healing songs. <laughs> That's what he wanted to talk about about his career as a, as a technician of. Yeah, Alton. Alton met uh, Alton met someone named uh, Luis T. Clarín when he was stationed in Manila is part of occupation, American occupation troops in 1946. And Clarine apparently was sort of a metaphysical thinker, a healer, um, and Alton already had musical interests. Alton discovered theosophy there, which was very, a very important part of, of kind of uh, urban Filipino culture. And so um, my guess is that the El Saturn LPs that are, as you point out, often, not often, but some of them are about Filipino music, uh, some of them are actually recordings of Daphne Clarine, who was a, the daughter of Luis uh, Clarine, who ended up coming to the States. And so, you know, I think that um, there, there's a, I mean, one of the things that, I, that following Alton and not just Sun Ra suggests is there is a kind of global dimension to the earlier formative um, develop of Alton that I think is also key to his own intellectual views, which were, um, you know, somewhat different from Sun Ra's, but in many ways um, close enough so that they could work together and sort of launch this, you know, these, these writings and this kind of intellectual and musical journey together. And I think also, as you've pointed out, Alton um, in many ways complemented Sun Ra so, so wonderfully because Alton was a businessman. He was interested in, in, you know, in the practical aspects of what it might be to launch an enterprise like El Saturn and what it might entail to try to make what I describe and other people have described as kind of an impossible utopian project somehow survive in a day-to-day, week-to-week environment that was very difficult. And you know, that's the other thing I, I wanted to do in the book is not sugarcoat how extraordinarily difficult economic conditions were in the South Side during this period, how challenging it was to find the, the local resources to keep this kind of project afloat. And Alton was absolutely key to doing that. William and John, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that we, we can have uh, much time to, to develop uh, the idea of uh, working uh, on, 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 on Chicago and, and, and the, uh, the economy and, and, and other uh, points. But I will, I will give the, the, la parole. I will, it's your turn, Michel, uh, Nicole, sorry. It's your turn to, to, to interact with, with William. Thank you. Thank you, um, and great to meet you, John. I think I met you a few times previously. Bill, I, I really am enjoying your book and congratulations. Um, one thing that you said in the beginning, which I think you clarify in your lineages chapter is that, you know, you talk about, first of all, you talk about Sun Ra and his relationship with time, but you also talk about how during his time, during his time of being alive, he, he didn't really get the type of recognition that he's getting now. And so in the sense of that, I feel that looking at time as nonlinear and in, in this kind of spirit of Afrofuturism, I think in the big picture, we can say that his impact is very, um, huge and and will continue to I think tumble down the hill in, in um as we as we go through the 21st century and so I think your book is a contribution to that so one thing I, I really also enjoyed you spoke about um Birmingham and 
and how you contributed um, another layer of understanding of his roots in Birmingham. And I especially enjoyed how you brought up how this sign of the magic city like appeared to residents you know, from the, you know, behind the facade, like the whiz, you know, um, <laughs> and, and I, I really enjoy that because it really brought a context that this has been like an ongoing, there's been ongoing influences of, of this idea of utopianism, like in his life. And uh, I was especially interested in this first piece that he wrote, the Chocolate Avenue piece, and at 15 and and also the frustration of having it recorded in a way that he wasn't happy with that might have spurred on the desire to go ahead and like you know or, you know move forward with his own recording label in the future i was wondering if you could share a little bit about that it, like any additional information you can share with those listening about the Chocolate Avenue, um, how that, you know, what other influences that might have come from. And I wanted to share just a really short poem of Sunrise in relation to it um, called The Visitation. Mm. In the early days of my visitation, black hands tended me and cared for me. Black minds, hearts, souls loved me and I loved them because of this. In the early days of my visitation, black hands tended me and cared for me. I can't forget these things for black hearts, minds and souls love me. And even today, the overtones from the fire of that love are still burning. In the early days of my visitation, white rules and laws segregated me. They helped to make me what I am today and what I am, I am. Yes, what I am, I am because of this. My image of paradise is chromatic black and chromatic black again. Those who segregate did not segregate in vain for I am and I am what I am. <laughs> That's a great poem, Nicole. Thank you for reading it. Yeah, Birmingham, um, as he alludes to in the poem, and as I try to sort of talk about in the book, um, was both a, a, an extraordinarily oppressive, restrictive, and violent place. Um, and yet it was also within that, or within the folds of that kind of a world, nurturing for Sun Ra. Uh, in, in ways that, that he himself recognized. And that, you know, I see as in some ways a very unique product of, of precisely the kind of separation of races, the sort of rigid Jim Crow system, the kind of ever present fear of, of white supremacist violence. And yet um, the ability of African-Americans within a city like Birmingham to build community institutions that might nurture their their young people that might provide opportunities for education. Um, Sun Ra himself or Sonny Blunt was an extraordinary reader. Uh, he was an extraordinarily gifted musician who then found a home in many ways uh, within the industrial high school and within kind of the musical world of, of Birmingham. Um, and I think as you point out though too, um, there's a sort of second kind of dimension to that story, which is also um, Sun Ra or Sonny Blunt also discovered um, ways in which one could, to put it bluntly, um, be betrayed by one's own. So that in a sense, the Chocolate Avenue story that you, that you relate, um, you know, this was, as far as we know, uh, one of the very first compositions by a very young Herman Blunt written when he was around 15 years old. We don't, as far as I know, no one has the composition. So uh, the only way we know of it is through the recording that Clarence Williams did. Uh, but evidently he sent it to Williams, who at that time um, was probably one of the foremost African-American music producers of the era, uh, who, at least as it seems on the surface, promptly appropriated it, used it, recorded it, uh, failed to acknowledge uh, its composer. And um, the result was, I think, a, a really profound sense of betrayal by, uh, by this young man. 
and a sense of enduring suspicion towards what we might call kind of conventional community leaders. So this is one of the reasons why in the book, I really try to kind of trace Sun Ra's arc, not just as a musician, but also as a, a kind of community leader, because he's looking for a way to be a different kind of community leader than at least some of the community leaders that he encountered in, um, in Birmingham. So this very complex relationship, right, to the community, um, which was deeply nurturing uh, and provided extraordinary opportunities within this larger world of deprivation and violence. But on the other hand, um, a, a, a sort of process of discovery where it was clear that he felt he needed to, to chart his own path. And what that path might look like required a lot of kind of musical and, and philosophical experimentation. Thank you. Yeah, that was definitely a great example of him not wanting to be the valedictorian. Mm. Who's ever heard of that? <laughs> Somebody just not wanting to like be front and center, but obviously having done the work to deserve it. And I'm going to jump now because I know we don't have a lot of time. So going to Chicago and, and, and going back to these, um, to my broadsheets um, that, you know, these are something that are very exciting when I first discover them. I think I first discovered some of Sun Ra's writings um, on 53rd Street in, in the record shop, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. and uh, of course I had already heard Sun Ra, but to find these, you know, little booklets of his and things mm -hmm. for sale that were still being reproduced by someone, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, was definitely exciting for me. Uh, I'm first curious, I think not to overlook the, the idea of, of the name of these, these broadsheets being named after this uh, comedic goddess of truth and, and equality. And I feel that there's no, no real separation possible between these religious uh, research and, and, you know, and looking into you know these ancient histories and this call for uh and search for ways of of inspiring black liberation i i, I really don't see a separation and this also the fact that he chooses a goddess versus a male god you know and and you know that's not unusual for how people look at wisdom. You know, there's al always kind of a, been a stereotypical embodying of, of the female energy as, as the holder of wisdom. Um, but it's just, it's just something that I think there's more there to, to find out about and to look into um, just because, uh, the idea, you know, you already spoke about with John about this idea of sexuality, not just not being a focus for Sun Ra in general. Um, and um, but and but the fact is, I mean, space in the place, we could talk about a lot of <laughs> very uh, questionable misogynist um, mm -hmm. things that we can witness within that film. And but then of course him not being the only person behind the creativity of that. But what I'm getting to is, um, I guess I'm curious like with that, like how much did you find in your research in terms of Abraham and him going to the uh, Oriental Institute mm -hmm. uh, for University of Chicago? Cause I know they have a really large uh, research materials on Egypt and I, and also like I'm just curious I and mean, you bring up the black Hebrew Israelites and you bring up the nation of Islam but um, his relationship with those entities with those and and also the Moors um, mm -hmm. if you could speak a little bit on those 
And, and the last thing I'll, I'll ask in that if you can speak on, if you know at all, is uh, Congo Beach, which no <laughs> one ever talks about, but mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely, I know, I just know that it had to exist at that time. And it's, you know, an African tradition that has been in Chicago longer than people can really date, but it's been a place not just for musical and community connection, but also for creativity and Afro-diasporic uh, communication. So I think that's kind of enough. To that's a lot, and, and thank you for all that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just to sort of maybe start with um, Washington Park, um, that's where I really try to, you know, so much of what I try to do with Sun Ra and Alton in the book is to locate them in terms of space and place in the city. And so um, Washington Park uh, in the late 40s and early 50s was a really, uh, those of you who are not from Chicago, Washington Park is a very important park at the center of the African American South Side. And um, it became a gathering place really for um, especially for religious groups, but really for kind of intellectual explorers and, and kind of political activists of all kinds. And so Nicole just alluded to, uh, you know, the, the Moors, uh, the Moors Science Temple of America, uh, the Black Israelites, um, the uh, uh, Ahmadi Islam, uh, the, a range of, of religious groups, Elijah Muhammad's group, the Nation of Islam, um, this was a place that um, that Sun Ra and Alton Abraham hung out with their uh, with their broadsheets and espoused sort of their own sort of histories of, of Africa and of the relationship of African Americans to uh, ancient civilizations. And um, obviously, the relationship between them and these groups was complex. Uh, my read of it is that they they both shared ideas and borrowed ideas. Uh, all of those groups were in some respects looking for answers to the identity quest, to kind of who are we in this world, in this society, in this city where we've become marginalized and defined by what we're not, then what are we? And so this search, uh, which became so central to the, to the broadsheets, you see it on every page, every biblical rereading, every sort of uh, polemical uh, gesture, um, was so crucial. And, and I think that, um, you know, your point is well taken is that for, for Sun Ra and for Alton, the, the, the sort of religious quest and the musical quest um, uh, and the philosophical quest are, are, are one quest and one journey. Um, and so I think this is very much why um, they saw this, um, these texts and this kind of intellectual process as the kind of launching pad for uh, for, for liberation, for new notions of self-determination. Um, I, I think your point about, um, you know, I think that uh, there's, a, there's, a there's a complex relationship that, um, that I think we can read uh, in terms of Sun Ra's relationship to masculinity. Uh, I think that on the one hand, um, you know, what we see uh, in terms of the evolving persona and performance style and, and even style of speech and, and, and reading that, that Sun Ra develops, um, it, it cuts very much against conventional uh, masculine forms of self-presentation in the day in ways that I think are um, really interesting and somewhat um, emancipatory for their time. Um, you know, they sort of create spaces in which thinking and talking and reflecting um, happens differently. Uh, by the same token, um, you know, it, it, the orchestra was a kind of a, a male fraternity, right? It really was. And, and this was before, you know, this is even before the 1960s and 70s when June Tyson becomes a part of the group and, and some of the effects that June and, and sort of other members had on the orchestra were, were, were significant. But in the 1950s, it was very much a kind of male fraternity. And in a lot of ways, you know, it was almost like a, a sort of, uh, you know, a fraternal order or a secret society in terms of the ways in which notions of, of, of masculinity were, were developed, cultivated, and, and also protected. Uh, so I, I think that, um, 
as I think you were suggesting, Nicole, I think this puts, uh, you know, it, it troubles and sort of makes us step back a little bit from the kinds of visions of, um, of Afrofuturism that we see later in, you know, in more full, full blown form in some of Sun, Sun Ra's work or some of his projects. You know, you mentioned the film Space is the Place. There's some very troubling presentations. Uh, as you point out, that's not entirely his, his, his artistic product. Nevertheless, um, I think that there's a certain kind of what I would call patriarchalism in, in Ra's sensibility and in his philosophy that I think, you know, one of the things that made me do in my final chapter of the book, Lineages and, and Legacies, was to also point to other Afrofuturist traditions that do not begin and end with Sun Ra, but that are also really important to artists and philosophers and activists today, folks like uh, Octavia Butler and Samuel Delaney. And I think um, the, the lesson there is that there are, there are many Afrofuturist traditions that, ex that really begin long before Sonny Blunt and Sun Ra, and they also extend well into the contemporary period and of course into the future. Awesome. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, William. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, about, I mean, Chicago uh, religions, religions, and also the the, the issue on on the misogyny uh, in in the fifties, sixties in in Chicago uh, and, and through Sandra's pass. Um, thank you, uh, Alexandre. Um, so I think that's uh, that's that's your turn. Um, so you can go whenever you want. If Alexandre is Thank you, Mr. Can you hear me? Do you hear me? Yeah. Well, That's yeah. okay. Perfect. I had, Thank some, you. I had some issues with my mic recently. Uh, it's a brand new computer, but I hope it will work. If not, I'll, I'll switch to my phone, okay? You let me know. If it becomes like an electronic music device, it's not a tribute to Sunrise, just an accident. <laughs> Um, hello, William. Hello, everybody. Um, nice to see you and hear you. Um, and in fact, my question is really, uh, my first question is really tied to, to what Nicole just said, uh, because the two of you, uh, Nicole and William, uh, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned um, Octavia Butler. And in, a, in the tribute of uh, Nicole Mitchell with the Black Earth Ensemble, I'm going to do some promotion for her in this recording. Nicole, you say something, you have this in the liner notes you wrote yourself. Uh, the only way to survive is to be altered. Um, and I was wondering, uh, because I like, as an anthropologist, and you know, there are a few here, including Frederick, I'm, uh, I'm really uh, uh, into that idea, you know, that post-colonial, post-modernist, post-futurist, post-whatever it is, idea. Uh, that yes, uh, in order to serve it, you need to be altered. And we know why Octavia Butler had this ID and developed this ID in uh, many novels. We can also know and understand why Sonra did something like that in his own music and his, in his utopia, as we we'll say. And in fact, there is a quotation of William, but that's why I'm doing some connection. William, you're using the concept of self-othering in your book. So it's a question for you as an anthropologist, uh -huh. and maybe a question for Nicole, you know, uh, between the idea of to, in order to survive, you need to be altered or to accept to be altered. Meaning you will be altered, but you will survive and you will alter yourself, the person or the culture that have altered you. Is it something you think Sunra did, including with Christianity? Because of course, we all know that uh, we talk a lot about Africa uh, uh, and, and his thinking about Egypt, a little bit about Ethiopia. Look, but we also know he was a lot into Greek philosophers, into Christian thinkers of all kinds. But he had the, his own way to understand them that was not really Christian. So could you come back on this concept of self-othering that I really enjoy? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think that one of the things is a sort of, you know, urban historian and urban sociologist I try to do in the book is to sort of anchor that kind of question in the Washington Park scene and even in the larger changes that Chicago was going through, particularly around race. And one thing that really struck me 
is that this period of the late 40s and early 1950s is a period in, uh, in American history where groups which formerly might have been othered, Jews, Italians, Poles, and so forth, immigrant groups, um, are in fact being conferred by the larger culture with a kind of ethnicity, right? They become Jewish Americans, they become Polish Americans, they become Italian Americans. And this, this process of kind of, of, of what we might call white ethnicization seems to be uh, sort of happening quite dramatically, precisely at a moment, of course, when African Americans are beginning to try to move out of the South Side into communities which are often greeting them with violence and exclusion. And so one of the, uh, one of the ways that I try to develop to read this moment of the, the broadsheets, which Nicole and I were talking about, um, written in the, in the early 1950s, is to see them uh, as, a, as a sort of search and an exploration for, um, for an, an African-American ethnicity. And yet, it's a, as you suggest, it's a very complex and sort of unconventional search for an ethnicity. It's one that sort of takes them, uh, you know, I think it, it does involve in part that journey that you described, which is a recognition of how one and one's colleagues and community members have been othered. And then looking closely at this process of othering as something which can be, can be turned which can be altered itself. And so this kind of, re, you know, and, and, and the, the biblical commentaries that, are, um, that are, are, are in the broadsheets are these very, very strange and extraordinary alterings. They're, they're commentaries, but they're alterings of the, the core biblical stories in a way that rereads the presence and importance of, of Africa, of blackness, and, and of black identity into uh, a set of you know, core texts in Western civilization that have erased that presence or, or that have rewritten it. And so um, finding uh, you know, that kind of, um, uh, the, the presence of, of Africa and blackness in the biblical scriptures then can serve as a, as a grounding point for um, a, a, a sort of, a, a re-articulated uh, um, black ethnicity, which in many ways, um, you know, I, is how I read the broadsheets, not so much as an ultimately a, a kind of religious uh, uh, faith, so much as, as a kind of religiously encoded uh, ethnic embrace of a, a new identity. And so I think that um, that sort of, um, that process, you know, what I what I call even kind of self exoticization, is a very emancipatory kind of gesture for these men because um, it's so liberating to be able to think of themselves as having so many different origin points around the world, and so many possible destination points in the future, when in fact the way in which time is typically envisioned for African Americans in the 1940s and 50s is a, as a prison, as a, as a slice, as a containment. And so, um, you know, I think you're, I think you're putting yourself, you're pu putting your finger on something very important. And I think it also appears in the music as well. This, this notion of altering music, altering the standards, for example. You know, one of the things we haven't talked about yet, which I, I was very struck by is how important the standards in the sense of traditional musical forms, uh, traditional pop music, uh, traditional spirituals, traditional kinds of song forms remain, those, those remain extremely important for Sun Ra because of course they never just remain traditional. They never just remain what they are. They are remade through his rearticulation musically. And so I think that um, that notion of othering uh, or altering um, finds its way into their kind of musical practice as well. And I tried to explore some of that. I don't know if you wanted me to respond, um, but you just brought up, Bill, about how the outer society, you know, imprisonment <laughs> is a good metaphor uh, for African American experience and, and Sun Ra's own imprisonment, like as a conscientious objector, you brought that up in the book. Um, and 
I'm so curious if there's ways to find out in how how impactful that was and how influential that was. But I, I I'm pretty sure that that definitely altered his way of um, approaching his goals and 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 moving forward and um, this idea of having to be altered to survive. I definitely, I, I, when I'm, when you're talking about this ethnic embrace, I'm, I'm looking at going back to that poem of chromatic black and just this idea of freedom being so central, um, liberation being so central and the idea of this diversity of, like you said, diversity of origins, but also diversity of consciousness. Um, the, the freedom to look at all these other texts and to craft your own your own spiritual text that can drive you know that can bring people to a new path you know um that's part of the beauty of being human is that we can change we can change course we can change our minds and we can change what we're doing even though there might be other forces that we don't necessarily have control over. Maybe when well, I'm just doing that, I'd say a word or two about uh, Nicole's last comment, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Um, you know, you, I think you, you began by pointing to, um, to uh, Sonny Blunt's imprisonment in uh, 1945 Birmingham for, um, object, for, for being a conscientious objector, for refusing his draft notice during World War II. Um, this was a really, really pivotal moment in his in his life um, because not, you know not just because um, it was so uh, so difficult um, to be confined in this way, but also because um, it also uh, was an extremely unpopular position, uh, not only within uh, sort of whites, not only among whites in Birmingham, but even within the black community. Who saw it as 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 uh, unnecessarily troublesome? Uh, it would invite the wrath of white supremacy even more strongly. And so, um, even after he was imprisoned and spent time in a civilian work camp, and then went back to Birmingham, it became really difficult for him to make music there. Uh, people were warned not to associate with him. Um, but on the other hand, what he discovered through that process too was um, a certain way to articulate what had already been, I think, a kind of pacifist uh, disposition that became really important when he came to Chicago. And he had a lot of younger musicians who, who came to him who were trying to figure out how to deal with their Korean War draft notices. And uh, you know, Richard Davis, the bass player, has spoken uh, really eloquently about talking to Sun Ra about that and not just the, what Ra said to him, but the kind of uh, the personification of courage uh, and individuality uh, that he saw in Sun Ra as someone who had had uh, the ability to, uh, to refuse to serve, to say, this is not my war, this is not my people's war. And um, he followed suit and others did as well. And so, I, you know, for me, this is another example of of Sun Ra as a community organizer, someone who is a leader among a group, both because of his example, but also because of uh, his ability to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to show how uh, the world appears differently from the way it actually is. And um, one needs to live one's life uh, in a different way if one's going to survive and thrive in it. Thanks so much. Alexander, are you back? I, yes, I think. Do you hear me now? I can. Is it good? It's good, good enough? OK. Now, it's a question for, again, it's a question for you, William, and maybe for Nicole as well. Will you say that, uh, um, uh, will you say that you, so we were, before we were talking about changing, adapting, being altered. Uh, the thing is, when you, when you look at someone like Sanra, is that, it does not change from one thing to the other. It switches, or yes, switched from unicity to multiplicity. And so, because there are many things, many elements, many compounds, many traditions, many visions in his cooking. You know, and that's the whole idea, I would say. 
you know, so I, w- I was wondering if you would agree on that because, and that's, that's also a lesson for a Westerner, even for a white Westerner, you know, because I don't know many people who are able to be into the Neoplatonist, who are into able, who are able to be in doo-wop music, in many kinds of symbolisms, in science fiction and new technologies, and and Kemet of ancient Egypt. You know, and I don't see why we should will not be able to do that. But to do that, Westerners will have to be accepted to be multiple and not single that they think they are. Well, that's another topic, but so would you say that to, to summarize, you know, like it's is you know to be altered is also also means that now you accept you have a multiple identity. I think it's an interesting way to think about it. I mean, it sort of takes us back to I think where John started from, which is that you you can imagine many different biographies of of Sun Ra because yep. he's there's so much there and there's so much and and I found that actually as somebody who's writing about Sun, about Sun Ra, I found that sort of daunting because I always felt like there were too many things I wasn't talking about, too many things he was saying, too many different kinds of of musical uh, experimentations that he was that I wasn't addressing in the book and um, you know I do think. Uh, I did often try to, to default to at least my version of what I think you were saying, which is that um, there's a kind of accretive quality to Sun Ra's work where each new encounter gives him something without taking anything away. And so there's this sense in which um, so many, and you, I think we see this especially even in the early music from, from Chicago from the mid 1950s, um, we see so many different um, sort of traditional, what I call traditional, kind of more mainstream um, uh, musical forms and practices being incorporated into the early orchestra. And at the same time, these sort of sudden gestures to something that is completely new and completely different and sort of the ability to sort of do both of those simultaneously um, ends up becoming a kind of a signature Sun Ra sound. But if I had to describe with one word or with one statement what that sound was, I think it would be difficult to do uh, because it, it maintains the sort of multi-form quality that you've referred to um, throughout his career, even as it evolves, changes, new members join the band, uh, it grows in size, it strips down to, to a kind of romp outfit. All of these changes do change. Uh, the orchestra and they do change Sun Ra, but in terms of the the musical and philosophical sensibility, it seems to only kind of grow. And so I think that um, trying to trying to kind of, you know, for someone who's kind of a flat footed urban sociologist and urban historian like myself, trying to kind of feel that you can you can capture some of that um, in a in a delimited time and space in a way that recognizes um, this, that recognizes Sun Ra where he was when I'm talking about him. In other words, that that does not bring from the future. It's not my job to bring where Sun Ra was in the 1980s back to my account of the 1950s. While at the same time, it's almost impossible to, uh, you know, it's it's impossible to fail to recognize the the way in which Sun Ra himself is constantly thinking into the future and back toward the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I had, had many questions as, I mean, as both a, a music anthropologist and urban anthropologist. I mean, your book is kind of one of a kind. So that's, that's pretty precious for, for seeing both studying music and urban uh, questions. And the first one is not about music, but it's about costumes. Uh, I was really interested in, in the ways that you were talking about the, the fact that he was using uh, a Turkish fez, uh, the story about the orchestra costumes. But I was wondering why you didn't dig into uh, Chicago black markets uh, in the South Side. And how did he, did he grab some? Uh, at the moment, you, you talk about the mother of Alton Abraham, I think, sir. And you, you are explaining that he's kind of a uh, looking after uh, objects and, and making at El Saturn and, uh, and uh, with the orchestra, uh, different kind of products, things, costumes. But I, I really wonder where he found the fabrics. I mean, the fabrics for the costumes. It, was, it, was it total costumes from, from a shop or, or did the fabric? Uh, so the, my first question 
will be, will be this one, uh, William. And th the next one is about your uh, author's notes, uh, which is really interesting in itself. And, and I have a, a comment about once you, you, you are talking about uh, different, sorry? Yeah, you are talking about the different uh, instruments in uh, in the, that uh, that uh, the orchestra and and the sonora and other musicians built, and at the moment you you are trying to to talk about African sam piano, and what's kind what's kind of odd to me because you know that's a colonial name to to name uh, uh, African sam piano, which is called senza or kalimba, and it reminds me of your notes about about. Uh, the fact that you wanted to use the kind of the, the right word or the word that Sunra or the black community in the 50s and 60s were using. So I was quite wondering, that's more a comment, but why you didn't choose to pick up the African uh, or so the African word for it, or if Sunra or, or the orchestra were talking about instruments with a name, with the African names, more than the, the, the colonial names. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Frederic. Um, so maybe starting off, I think, uh, you know, your first question was about costumes. And, and I, think, um, I think John actually pointed out in Space in the Place, Space is the Place, that at least some of the costumes Alton got from a, a sort of an opera company, which had been sort of uh, sidelined or which had some available uh, costumes. And so, you know, I think that, um, I, I honestly don't know where a lot of the other uh, costumes came from. Um, and I don't, I'm trying to think, um, it's a fair question. I may not have spent, you know, I may not have given that sufficient, uh, you know, attention in the book, but I don't think the, you know, I, the, the Alton Abraham collection of Sun Ra, uh, which is the sort of major archive that came from Alton Abraham's house, uh, which does have all sorts of interesting objects, uh, visual objects and um, artifacts and so forth. I don't think costumes got saved. Uh, and so I think that we would know a lot more if, uh, if the entire contents of Alton's house had been saved by John Corbett rather than just some of it. Um, so I, you know, I, but I think it's, you know, I, as, as I do try to point out at one point in the book, costumes, and, and you've, I think mentioned this, costumes are very important to Sun Ra and the orchestra. Um, you know, I think one, of the, one comment that Sun Ra made is, is, is what I interpreted as a kind of a Marcus Garveyite kind of comment that, you know, in many ways he thought of costumes as kind of the uniform of, uh, of a new kind of um, of a new African American um, you know explorer group in a sense um, and so costumes um, you know he described at one point Ra referred to costumes as music uh, that a lot of what it, the work that it does uh, is to convey many of the things that he was trying to do through his music um, you know I think the other thing I try to point out in the book about costumes is uh, it wasn't just Sun Ra who thought costumes were important, right? I mean, this was uh, in a moment where the sort of exploration of identity through, through dress was undergoing a really profound transformation in Black Chicago, right? This was a period of rising Pan-Africanism. Uh, there, there was a new availability of, um, you know, of, 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 of material and, um, garb and clothes, other kinds of accessories from the mother continent. And there was a, a, a sense of, um, of redefinition. And we see it in the Chicago Defender Society pages that I talk about. And so I, I, I don't know beyond that, sort of how the kind of costuming sensibility evolved uh, over the course of the 1950s, but clearly um, it, was, uh, it was a moment where the band is sort of trying out new, um, uh, new performance styles and new ways to present themselves and audiences are responding themselves with new, uh, probably new costumes and new ways of presenting themselves. And so I think that's a very interesting uh, dimension of this, uh, of this story. I think in terms of your, your point about um, the instruments, um, 
I think that's also a good point. I, I think I may have just, def it, it could be just carelessness on my part that I sort of defaulted to uh, my description of this particular instrument. Um, I don't really know. Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't I think I, Nicole. I can add something to that. That yeah. was that was the term that Phil Coran used to, to define his own, the instrument as he was playing it. That was his description and definition. So. I think you were just honoring the fact that he was the one playing it and that was the way he, that was how he called it. Um, he felt that by electrifying it, that now, it, you know, he didn't have to use whatever previous names were for that instrument, that it was now a new instrument because it was electrified. So I'll just add that. Thank you, Nicole. I think that's right. The film himself, I think, had multiple names that he gave these. Uh, one, one name that stuck to my mind was the Frankie phone, uh, which he yeah, named, the Frankie phone, yeah, right, which he named, and apparently his mom's name was Frankie. Um, so I think that there are a lot. There's a lot that goes into these names. I do think at one point, um, you know, I think we see it on orchestra uh, liner notes. Uh, we see uh, certain bells being described as Nigerian bells, and uh, to my ear, at least, and maybe I'm wrong. Um, you know, they sound a lot like sleigh bells. The sort of 99 cent toy that you can get around Christmas time in, in Chicago, you know, variety or $1 stores. Um, I don't know if that's true, but I think there is, you know, the creative renaming of, of instrumentation is obviously an important part of, of the orchestra's um, kind of musical project as well. Thank you. Thank you, William. And thank you, Nicole, for the, uh, the update also and the, the information. Um, so yeah, Greg, uh, I think you're, you're probably listening to us right now. Yeah. Great. And, um, so yeah, um, so if you, if you have some question for William about his books, that's, that's our pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, apologies for the tardiness. I didn't have uh, English translation on my email, so I just thought it was six o'clock today. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys have already talked about um, just the debate session Sunrod used to hold in the park with, um, you know, uh, various corner scholars and and uh, Nation of Islam members. You know, it seems like he had a big effect on the evolving um, mythology of the Nation of Islam, uh, particularly the biblical interpretation. So I don't know if you guys have gotten into that already. We, we, we did. I'm happy to talk more about it, but uh, we did talk a little bit about the, 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 you know, in particular, it's its role as a, yeah, as, as a kind of a, you know, I, I refer to it in the book as like a lyceum. It's a, it's like a, it's like an informal kind of debate society learning, learning space for the community, uh, and in particular for those parts of the community that don't have uh, a lot of money and don't have an institutional presence easily within kind of mainstream society and. Um, you know, for Wash, for for Alton, and for for Alton Abraham, and for Sun Ra, and their colleagues, this was a place where they could really kind of develop their own ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, and any idea about um, just what kind of um, um, issues um, or uh, topics that they were having a back and forth on? I mean, I think that you know, my my interpretation is that these that these polemical broadsheets that were part of uh, Alton Abraham's uh, materials that ended up in the Alton Abraham li collection of the, of the library at the University of Chicago. Uh, those broadsheets, I think, um, give us both a sense of kind of the, the biblical study dimension of what their group was up to, the importance of rereading uh, not only the Bible itself, but these uh, inherited biblical commentaries, which had, sort of both extended that tradition of biblical commentary, but also kind of overturned it by, by, by rereading, as I was saying earlier, kind of biblical stories in a way that put black people at the center of, of the early development of civilization and mm -hmm. of the early formation of, of, of culture itself. And so, you know, I think that these are ideas that, that, that they were playing with, but it's also, those are ideas that many of the other groups that were hanging out in Washington Park were also playing with the, you know, the Morris Science Temple, the uh, Black Israelites, the uh, Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam. These groups were 
in their different ways, looking for an origin point for African-American civilization um, that would impart or kind of serve as a launching pad for, for re-envisioning African-American identity in the post-World War II Chicago world. Uh, you know, the other thing I mentioned earlier that I think is important is that uh, many other groups in Chicago were gaining an ethnicity in the post-war period. Uh, mm. In other words, they were becoming white people who had a particular ethnic culture. Uh, these were descendants of immigrants from Europe mainly, right? And um, one of the things that really jumps out at you, at me at least, from these broadsheets is um, this question, what is our ethnicity? Uh, you know, what does is, what is the African-American ethnicity look like in a, mm -hmm. in a post-war society which is denying it to us? How can we create one for ourselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, you know, because Ra emerges at the same time as rock and roll emerges and, that, and that's a very particular answer to that question, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, such idiosyncratic figures as Little Richard and James Brown and Bo Diddley and Chuck Berry, Big Mama, you know, Sister Rosetta are all answering in their own, uh, you know, both public and private kind of ways. Uh, when I came in, you guys were talking about the, the costuming and it was, uh, you know, I've been having a few conversations with folks about, you know, just having how important that sense of spectacle was the sunrise, but I always, you know, when I when I teach her, I always talk about, um, you know, him being one of the avatars of, you know, what we call Afrofuturism, who was about an embodied Afrofuturism, you know, it was like a lived um, projection of the thing, you know, so you see in the costuming, you know, which is so visionary, you know what I mean? You, you mm -hmm. just think about somebody who's like decided like, okay, we're going to step out of, you know, the, um, you know, the, the, the suits and tie version, you know, <laughs> the clerical looking version of a jazz musician. And mm -hmm. we're going to give you something that kind of uh, blends and blurs, you know, the ancient and the futuristic, you know, um, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the extraterrestrial, you know, kind of in one. And, um, you know, once we commit to that, we're going to stick to it. It's like, you know, we, we all know, like, if you showed up at Sunrise House at four in the morning, um, he'd be looking to like the sunrise you saw on the stage and he'd probably be in the middle of a eight hour rehearsal, you know, but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just, um, it was so in the, the vein of what, you know, um, how the Germans have a word for it. it means like a total, total art, you know, that kind of brings together, um, you know, theater, music, painting, all of that, you know what I mean? It's uh, certainly what was, um, uh, you know, what was being done in, um, you know, early, you know, 19th, or 20th century Paris, mm -hmm. you know, bringing together, you know, Stravinsky and Picasso and, uh, you know, Russian ballet and so forth, you know. Um, so it's a continuation of that, of that kind of uh, mixing and mashing up uh, uh, that's going on in modernity, you know, for most of the 20th century, for sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's, I think that's really, that's, that's a really useful way to think about it. The, the, the radical modernism, that we see in Sun Ra, um, it does incorporate so many of these elements uh, in a new way. Yeah. So, you know, and, and I think, and, and you know, one of the things I like about the sort of photographs that you see from 1950 Chicago and the band is you can sort of see this develop a little bit over time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, the 1955 photos is, you know, very straight looking cats who, you know, have the suits. And, and the other thing you notice about these early photos of the band too, is that Sun Ra himself is like in the back, right? He's kind of almost hidden behind a wall of musicians and instruments. And, yeah. and, and it's, I think it also speaks to, you know, his, his growing sense of, of, um, of leadership uh, that, um, that, that, that requires what you're talking about, this kind of, that requires embodying Afrofuturism, which means you need to be seen, you need to be out front, you need to have, a, you need to project who you are yeah. and, well, and, and we're through the costumes and the instruments. Well, you know, it's, it's very interesting too, though, to say that though about him being in the back, when I think about like um, his greatest protégés in terms of black like, popular music, George Clinton and Maurice White, you know, they both were pretty discreet in the early in the early records. You know what I mean? They didn't really put themselves out front. They were part of an ensemble, part of a collective that was projecting. You know, um, you know, it's very uh, futuristic Afro Afro alien kind of presence. 
you know, Afro, uh, you know, Egyptian extraterrestrial <laughs> kind of presence, you know. Um, and, you know, it's not, you know, and, you know, you can go through those early records by, uh, you know, P-Funk and Earth, Moon and Fire, and, you know, you're, you're aware that there's this character there, you know what I mean? And, you know, you know, if you, if you read that line of notes, you, you kind of get the, you know, get how important George Clinton and Maurice White are to the thing, but, um, you know, so they're kind of, they're kind of giving you this there and not there kind of um, representation of, them, of themselves, you know, it's like kind of eschewing the cult leader aspect mm -hmm. of the thing while <laughs> totally running it, you know, <laughs> like in a, in a cult leader kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I, you know, it's, you make the connection is George Clinton, you know, one of the things I try to do in the book is to situate Sun Ra really deeply in the city and to sort of, to see him kind of within an urban culture, a black urban culture. Um, and, and I think we do, we can do that with George Clinton as well. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's not, I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, before George was doing the Mothership Connection, he did Chocolate City. And, and, and so the, um, the way in which, um, you know, what we might call kind of, you know, black empowerment or black emancipation narratives move from kind of the terrestrial to, to the extraterrestrial um, in many ways is a sort of, a, I see it as, as sort of a use or a, a reappropriation of the city as a kind of launching pad for, for you know, for new, new projects of liberation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mitch, Greg. Thank you, William. Um, I guess it's maybe we are going to switch on on having questions from the audience, um, Arno, and uh, but, uh, of yes. course we can we can still continue on on those topics. Exactly. Uh, so we have uh, one question from uh, John Ellis: Did Sunra and Malcolm X interact in either Chicago or New York City? I can speak to at least what I know about the Chicago part of the question, which is, I was really curious to find the answer to that question and I wasn't able to find it. The, there is good evidence um, that Malcolm X was in Chicago multiple times during the 1950s. Uh, he was a very young organizer for Elijah Muhammad. He came out from Detroit. He spent time at, 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 uh, at, at Elijah's house. Uh, and he, uh, you know, was very active in the community. He may have been, it's hard to imagine he wouldn't have spent time at all in Washington Park. I would think that would be one place that he would want to be uh, based on what we know. But as far as I can tell, um, Sun Ra never talked about meeting Malcolm in Chicago uh, and that Malcolm never mentioned meeting Sun Ra in Chicago. Uh, in terms of subsequently, like in New York in the 1960s, that I can't speak to as well. And maybe John or other people uh, have have a sense of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, because we know Rod acknowledges himself as like having an impact on the Nation of Islam, and particularly, you know, kind of battling with some of the people who would have been Malcolm X's mentors. I imagine in the nation too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they you know, Ra and the, the the as they call themselves the Thamai group. Uh, it, at this period, Alton Abraham and several other men um, certainly interacted with members of the nation in Washington Park, no question about it. Um, and there was a lot of dialogue back and forth. And there's a lot of, as, as Greg's suggesting, um, you know, each arguing they influenced the other. Um, I think what's really clear is if you read the broadsheets, um, the theology there in Sun Ra and Alton Abraham's notion of, 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 religious identity uh, and, of, and, of, and of who African-Americans are is quite different from those of the nation. Um, even though there may be certain kind of polemical phrases that we see shared and certain notions of, um, of critique of white society that are also shared. Yeah, well then we know the nation has their own um, like science, science fiction, speculative fiction narratives, you know, um, you know, running around uh, Ezekiel in the flying wheel and then around uh, Yakub and, mm -hmm. you know, white folks in genetic labs like millennia ago, 
you know. Um, so they're, they're operating in this in this zone that's in between politics and uh, and uh, kind of uh, um, science fiction speculation, you know. Uh, around like the political project has a lot, it's a lot of science fiction woven into it, or you know, and vice versa, you know, with Roth, yeah. Yeah, the um, genius of Elijah Muhammad and Sun Ra is they treat the Bible as a Sun Ra as a text, yes, a uh, science fiction text. And they were, they changed it accordingly. I mean, uh, it was laden with some of the terms for the fact that both of them were rewriting these incidents like the um, fiery chariots and so on. Sun Ra referred to in songs and so forth. Oh, well, they had they had several biblical texts mixed up in there deliberately, I think. So, and I won't go as far as one of the black leaders at the time who said <laughs> that uh, Malcolm um, Malcolm uh, and Sun Ra had both absorbed Milton, John Milton. Mm. Milton's also dealing with Jesus coming down in the war of the angels and so forth in the chariot, killing people. You know, that's the that's that's a Christian text that Christians don't even accept. Jesus was murdering angels, here. but yeah, which which takes us to, which takes us to Nat Turner, right? <laughs> you know, exactly. Like you know, profoundly infinite, you know, influenced by his own take on biblical prophecy. So then, and then when you think about the way that folks, um, you know, of course, revise the the spirituals to use them as like as code songs, you know, on the Underground Railroad, you know, you see, you know, you see that like, you know, I mean, there, there, there's definitely this nineteen. 18th century, you know, kind of kind of roots to kind of black speculation, you know, that 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 jumps off from the uh, from the Bible or from Benjamin Banner's Benjamin Banneker's case in actual astronomy, but we know like um, you know like Harry Tubman, um, Sojourner Truth, very mystical, and uh, very much thinking about uh, you know uh, celestial mapping, you know uh, celestial uh, projection. In terms of um, in terms of their their ideologies, philosophies, you know, so it's kind of like you know, there's this black stargazing tradition that runs through abolition, you know what I mean? Frederick Douglass, the North Star, you know, all of that. So, you know, rise in that tradition too. He is, and what, one of the interesting folks who are also in that tradition who I ran across was was an activist and and religious figure named Robert Athley Rogers, who who wrote a book called The Holy Pivy. Uh, in the early 1920s. And uh, he was, at the time, I think he's originally from, from Jamaica for the Caribbean, but he was living in Newark. And uh, he was very much influenced by Marcus Garvey. And if you read the Holy Pibby, it's fascinating. He basically sets himself up as, as a kind of a, a godlike figure who's presiding over this kind of cosmo this cosmology at which Africa is at the center. And so it's a very interesting kind of early articulation of, 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 of the Afrofuturist project um, in a religious context, but where it's also very clear that there's a kind of a political current there as well, that it's really about, um, it's about emancipation and it's about reordering one's sense of what the center of the world is in order so that you can be, you can be at the center of it. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was hard to imagine any Black liberation project that isn't like fundamentally futurological, <laughs> you know. You raised uh, Harry Tubman. I've been sleeping on her, but um, I get the sense that she was like an Earth Sun Ra. She's a very performative, yeah. changing yeah. voices, singing, breaking into things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, like, um, I mean, obviously working with some kind of version of Sixth Sense, Second Sight. You know, yeah. make all those journeys back and forth and not get caught, you know, but then, um, you know, I mean, the Underground Railroad itself is just still such a mystery. It's like nobody's divulged no secrets right. yet. Right. You know what I mean? It's like one of those rare moments in history where, where, you know, nobody unzipped the lip, you know, but um, but I you know there's this great statement that uh, Tubman made towards the end of her life and she's talking to, you know, to generations unborn and she just says like, um, you know, something like, you know, continue to reach for the stars, you know, you have the ability to manifest whatever it is you dream, you know, um, mangling in it, but that's, but that language is essentially there, you know what I mean? And then, you know, and then of course, like, you know, I mean, she's, she's also kind of like the, the Ur James Bond, 
as well. <laughs> it was about, you know, that attack on the, the combine heat plantation. It's literally. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, and it's using all this new like military technology. You know, it's like there's mines, there's all kind of rockets, you know what I mean? So again, it's that embodied futurism that comes through, uh, you know, comes through a freedom fighter. Yeah. Well, Mr. Samaraz, you tried to ask him a question about his relation to any any black leader, you were in trouble. She was going to either ignore it or create an alter figure of some sort or um, explain to you how they went wrong. And, and you have to forgive him that because he also changed himself continually. Yeah, yeah. He, he became an, he, he became, he, up comes the angel race. And I never quite understood that until I paid closer attention to what he was saying. But so, yeah, and, uh, well, you know, I mean, and and of course, that kind of um, that kind of um, identity switching, you know, um, ideology change and things. I mean, that's part and parcel of the whole tradition, too. If you look like, you know, you look at somebody like Frederick Douglass. I mean, he wrote his autobiography like three times, and it's like a, <laughs> each one is a revision of the one before. You know what I mean? You know. So I mean. You know, and then of course, you know, the changing of the name goes on with him as well, with Harriet Tubman, you know. Um, I, I thought of you, by the way, when um, yeah. Sunrise started introducing the angel race and he says, you don't know they're here, the angels are everywhere. Yeah. Because you don't know about him. He says, you no, know, I'm, you know, I'm a vision. What is he rejecting the black race? Whatever. And then he says, the reason is you don't know about him. They didn't come in through Ellis Island. They came in through the Commerce Department. I thought that's something you would have said. <laughs> Man, thank you, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, but it's like, I mean, all, all these figures are are just, um, you know, they tell, they all think of identity as being fluid, of course, because it's all imposed on them, you know what I mean? They, they know they've got, that's part of the option of, of, um, of being a self-liberator, comes with being a self-liberator, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you, get, you get to redefine everything from, you know, from the square root, you know, <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, look at somebody like Baraka, man. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's like about three or four lane, name changes that go on. <laughs> they, all made the same, they all made the same thing, the king. Yeah, exactly, the king, right? Yeah, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, but you know, and it's all part of the word play in that tradition too, you know, but um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> you know. Prince. Exactly, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, like there, there's nothing that says you you have to like obey these rules, or or obey the whatever the letter is or the the birth certificate mm -hmm. is around around identity. It's like that self making is very much a part of like, you know, like the creative tradition, the liberating tradition, you know. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Can can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So. Uh, we don't have uh, more questions from from the audience, so I think we can we can stop here. Uh, or perhaps we you have other comments to to make. I don't I don't know as you wish. Oh, yeah, I would I would just jump in and say how honored I am that all these folks are are here and uh, I've been able to have a conversation with them. It's been really um, you know these are folks who I've either listened to their music or learn from their books uh, or, um, or both. And, and it, it's been real, it's been a pleasure for me to kind of be able to, to sort of have a conversation about Sun Ra and about kind of Afrofuturism um, with folks that I've learned so much from. Thank you very much to you, Bill, uh, for uh, participating to this webinar. And thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, it was a great pleasure for the center uh, in Paris to have you, and we hope to welcome you one day uh, in Paris uh, at the center. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you, Nicole, for putting me into the timeline. On time. <laughs> <laughs> it's all circular, so <laughs> you were here at the time. You, you definitely made a big impact, so. Yeah, thank you, Greg, and I apologize about that. It's my fault. It happens, yeah. Zoom, Zoom time and COVID time, man. Anything can happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So thank you, folks. Okay. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.